Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. In this week's video, we are gonna look at effects. I'm gonna try and cover as many as possible and give some like little tips and tricks on different effects and maybe using and abusing them to get a different sound. But let's get into it. I know it can be a little bit daunting when you first get your recording software or you get, you open up the Ableton, Logic, whatever, and you see all these effects and you might have some idea about what they can do, but overall you might need a little bit more guidance or you might just wanna look for some new tips and tricks on how to use things that you already know. So I've kind of cut this up into uh, time-based effects and then we have, um, we have dynamic, which is gonna be compressors and gates and stuff like that. And then I put the EQs and filters and distortions at the end. So the first one we have is a reverb and most people know what a reverb is. It's gonna give you that sound of a space. So if you add it to multiple instruments or you send multiple instruments to that reverb, it will kind of give that feeling that they're all in the same space. But there's other ways we can use it creatively. So I just have this little effect. I take the reverb off here. Just a little synth line. It's just a loop that I found in my loops folder. And we've got the reverb here. You can see this is the, the chroma verb. It has some more, more features that some other reverbs have and other reverbs will have more than this has. But essentially what you're gonna have is your decay time. So if we put the dry to about 70 and then we can have the reverb up. To about 50. If I bring the decay down all the way, you can hear it's very upfront. And then as I increase that decay, we'll go up to say two seconds. You can hear the tail off there, and then you can kind of go extreme to where it kind of turns into a drone. So you have some other bits and pieces. You can see this has a little EQ on there, so you can kind of do some EQing and stuff like that. But I find that with reverbs and, and delays for the time based, you can use them either as an insert, so meaning on the channel strip, or you can use them as a send and return. If I want to use the reverb in like a creative way to kind of change a sound or, or use it in a more of a sort of non-traditional way. I will use it as an insert. And if I want to kind of give multiple instruments or multiple sounds and I want them to sound like they're in the same space, I'll use it as a send. So I have a template set up. If I push X to bring out the mixer, you can see here we've got reverb, medium, large, massive reverb, and then we have some delays and stuff like that. So I already have that set up. So when I come here, I can come in and I can just choose my reverb and I can choose the amount that I want to send to it. That's pretty basic stuff. But let's look at some creative ways that we can use a reverb to get maybe a different sound and to ways that you can use it, not just as a send. So the first one is gonna be to add more depth to your mix. So if I bring the reverb back up, and now I'm spending a lot of time on the reverb because there is a lot to cover, whereas EQ, not so much. So we have this here. If I pull the reverb down all the way and we just bring the, the dry wet, I bring it, 70 is good, we'll just keep it there. So we have our dry wet, and as we increase the wet amount, we can kind of give the illusion that we're pushing the sound further back in the mix. So if we probably don't need it at 33 seconds, let's just set this to default. And then as I pull down the dry, We'll start with the wet down at zero. As I pull down the dry and add the wet, we're gonna get that push, pushing back of the sound. So 
if I take it off, I feel like it's a lot more up front. And when I put that on, it feels like it's pushed the sound a little bit further back. So this is really good when you're starting to mix tracks and you feel like everything is really up in your face. You can use this trick to kind of push some elements a little bit further and kind of give everything its own space. Like think of a band playing live. You have the drummer at the back, you might have the vocalist in front, guitarist to the sides and stuff like that. You can kind of do the same with your different elements within the track. You can kind of start to push and pull bits and pieces to not only give your mix like a good stereo spread, but you can, you can also kind of give it depth within the mix. And the next one is kind of borrowing from the same, the same technique. And this is really, I picked up this, this trick because it's in, um, a tracks remix of the year years heads will roll you can hear there's a synth that comes in at the break and it's like the one element and you can hear it comes from the back of the mix forward while being filtered so i've got a filter and i've got the reverb on here we'll bring up the automation but the filter opening and then we have the wet coming down to zero or coming down to six and then the dry going from zero up to 70. So if we play those together. So it's a way you can introduce an element by using reverb and a filter. So you're not just filtering the highs and bringing it up. You're actually kind of opening the sound and bringing it in from the back of the room to kind of in the front of the, the listener. And then lastly, Lastly, we have just a little effect where you can take single hits to give them more emphasis within the track. So I just have this drum loop. And you can already hear there's some reverb on that just from um, that was baked into the loop. But I've gone and I've set up a reverb. I've taken some of the elements here and the reverb I've got set about 57 and I've no dry because the dry is coming from the original and then if I play that you can hear we've got a little bit more and this is really good you can use this on vocals maybe you've got um, percussive loop and you just want single hits to kind of pop out every now and then. It's a way that you can quickly just use, if you've printed the audio, you can cut bits out, send it to an effect and then away you go. Next up, we're gonna talk about delay. And for this, I'm gonna use the H delay. I really like this one and I know that a lot of people use it. So the delay is kind of, you've got a couple of key elements that are gonna be on almost every delay. You have the delay time, and for this we have it set to BPM, so it's gonna be synced. We can change it to milliseconds, so you can get more data and get some more crazy sort of sounds, and we're gonna explore them in a little bit. You have the feedback, so the amount of delays that are gonna happen. So if I have this set here, you can hear that going, if I increase that, up the dry and wet. We slow that down, increase the feedback a bit more. And you can hear it takes the tail longer to, to run out. So that's gonna be the feedback. Obviously you have the dry wet, so the amount of the signal, whether it's coming from the delay or just the dry signal. Some other Functions that some of them I have is you have this filter. So if we go all the way to the wet, bring this up. If we start to... We can just high pass just the wet. So we're gonna get that like little sparkle of the delay. And then if we pull it back down, just giving us the top frequency of the delays, but it's not affecting the original signal. 
So that's another one. And then we have a little um, modulation on this one. The other bits and pieces we have is this analog. It kind of just adds a bit of noise. I always tend to turn that off just because if you're recording hardware stuff, it already comes with a little bit of noise. And then if you add that, kind of sounds a bit weird having all these bits and pieces. So there we go. That's pretty much the delay. Delays are really good to kind of um, offer some more thickness to a track if you if you, you've just got single hits, you can kind of fill it out by just uh, having the feedback sort of tail in and fill in sections between, say, if you have a stab, you have stabs going and it can kind of fill out that tail without having to have held notes and taking up a lot of frequency. So the first trick that I like to do, and this is again with the H delay, and I found that it, it doesn't tend to work too much on too many different delays but it works really well with the H delay is to kind of abuse the hell out of it. So I've got it set to milliseconds. We have the dry wet sort of around the 10 o'clock position, 10 maybe 11 o'clock and then I use this delay amount to kind of get a metallic sound. It's almost taking it from a delay into flanger phaser chorus but it doesn't get so so small on the delay time that you kind of get into that world, but you can still get some really cool metallic sounds. And I find that uh, artists like uh, Sophie, Jimmy Edgar, and a few others did this really well. So if we kind of go up around 100, you can hear it's kind of whatever. Here, because it's so tight, we're getting that nice metallic sound. And kind of mess with the dry wet a little bit more. And you can hear there, you're kind of getting that sound. I didn't try it before, but if we take these little hits here, Bring him down. There you go, that's that sort of, sort of Sophie sort of snare sound. And you can do that to add some more variation to your track. Same as what we did with the reverb up here, you could have the H delay or a delay that's giving you that similar effect as a second track and you can kind of just automate that, that delay time just a hair. Like everything within like 30 to, to zero is going to give you a really good sound. You can kind of just modulate that a little bit to get you just variations on that snare sound. And then lastly, we've got the delay again. And similar to what I did with the reverb before, we just have a reverb. And so we have this delay track and I have this different delay on here. Let's see if we, yeah, bring it over. I have this free delay that I got from Native Instruments. I have the mix set to all the way wet and a little bit of feedback. I have the filter on to kind of, again, filter some of that sound. And then if we play the bit. Every day. It gives a nice little tail on to give it a little bit of effect without having to automate on the track. You can kind of just add it and you have a little bit more control over the delay and everything like that. And continuing on from the time-based effects, I've kind of lumped flanger, chorus, phaser all into one. I've got some demonstrations for each, but it's all, they're all very similar. The only thing that's changing is how fast or like how close the the um, the audio is and if there is resonant peaks within the EQ that kind of give you that like a, a phaser will have those like high peaks and kind of move it around to get more of a spacey more of a spacey sound. It's kind of similar to, to flanger. So for this one I've got the flanger and we just have the retro synth. I have it off at the moment. But you can hear if I if I just detune this um, this oscillator. 
bring it back. All in and then slight detune. We get that sort of phasey sort of sound. And if I bring up the flanger, very similar, but just with a like more of like if you had a resonance EQ on there as well. Turn that off. See, very, very similar. So you can kind of understand what's going on. It's just slightly putting the, the audio off sync a little bit. So I like to use a flanger if I want more of a spacey sort of, I say spacey because that's what it kind of sounds like to me. I'll put it on maybe hats. Very rarely I put it on synths, but I, I like it on hats because that flanging effect it will kind of give movement to the whole hi-hat track. So if you're using audio samples for your hi-hats and you haven't put too much in the way of automation and modulation throughout the whole thing, putting the, that flanger on there and just having a tiny little bit will give the whole thing a nice little bit of movement throughout the whole, the whole section. So to demonstrate that sort of sound that I was talking about with the hi-hats, I just put in a simple 808 drum kit with the closed hat. And this is what we got, very static, no movement at all. This is just pretty much the default preset from the flanger. And you can hear it's just giving us nice movement continually sort of going up and down to put it throughout the whole track. So it can help give a lot more movement to something that's very static. So next on we're going to touch on chorus. Chorus is much like the flanger phaser, but the delay time of the copy is a little bit longer. So that's why you're going to get a slightly different sound. So the copy obviously is being modulated to give you that sort of moving sort of feel to it. I have the, this synth from, whoa, that sounds super dark. Let's bring that up one octave. Let's go up here. There we go, that's about, I have like a keyboard and I'm obviously using to control it. So a bunch of synths will have this built in, but we also have the plugin chorus so we can see, oh, we can close this one and we can see what's going on. So if I turn this on, Immediately, you can hear that sort of widen and thicken up the sound. If I, you can hear that's the modulation rate of how fast it's kind of moving. So obviously zero is gonna get, it's like almost stacked. It's gonna have the original sound and then the copy and no sort of modulation. So it's just gonna sound very, Kind of like if you plug a stereo signal from a synth into a mono input and you'll hear like this weird sort of sound. But as soon as you add a little bit to the rate to modulate that copy, we're gonna get a nice thick sound. Again, intensity, pull that down kind of sounds a little bit weird. And you can hear that. So they're going back and forth to the, the modulation that's happening between the copy and the original. So I like to use, obviously, synths. It's king on synths. And I'll show you from this little patch here with the built-in, so we have very upfront, very dry, very in your face. We have no extra effects on there, just, just the patch itself. And then when I add the built-in reverb, 
thickens it up. We got the other one. Just a bit, a bit of variation. Obviously we don't have any controls over this one, but this is the free one. And you can hear, if I turn this on, there's not that much in the way of difference. I think the one built in sounds a little bit better, but for a free little chorus plugin, can't go wrong. And again, since it's really good, the other thing that I like to use it for is if I just want to thicken something up, maybe a vocal, maybe a um, just like a little like an effect or something like that, just something that is a little bit thin in the mix and I just wanted to, to widen it out and to thicken it up a little bit. Obviously adding that copy and just modulating a little bit will give us a wider sound. You can go overboard, you can add it to a bunch of stuff and it tends to kind of just blow the sound a little bit. So just using it sparingly in that case to sort of thicken it up, but I find that it's really good in that instance. Next up we have dynamic effects and by dynamic I mean compressors, gates and stuff like that. So we've got this, we can bring up, we have lots of plugins that I can show you here to show you what's going on with the compressor. So what, what is a compressor? compressor effectively is the volume control. So when that compressor hits, it's like turning it down just a tiny little quick and that's obviously dictated by the, the attack and the release. But it's just turning that signal down just a little bit. And you're probably wondering how much is it turning it down and how is it turning it down? So what I can do is we go view our window transport. And is it this one? Here we go. So you can see below we have this little, we have this drum loop. And I'm going to open the compressor up. We can go through some of the controls. Threshold is obviously when the compressor is going to kick in. It's going to rely on obviously on the input signal. So if the track you have is very quiet, it's going to take a lot from the, the threshold to actually start to trigger that, that compressor. We have the makeup, so this is the volume that you're gonna add at the end of it. We have the knee, which is effectively how quick the compressor or how smooth the compressor is coming on. When it comes on, is it gonna like just smoothly come on or is it gonna be coming on very quickly? And then we have the attack and release, pretty self-explanatory. But for the, and lastly, the ratio. And this is the, the thing that I got explained to me and I was like, okay, this is really good. So you can see here up the top in this little bit here, as I increase it, we have 2.6 2 to 1, 2.8, 3.1 to 1, and so on and so on. And then obviously all the way to 30 to 1. What do those numbers mean? So if we go to five to one, and we've got our little guide here. So threshold effectively will start, and we can see as we pull down the threshold, these peaks start coming in. And you have these different peaks. So we're at five to one, so it will divide any peak by five and then that's how much sound will come through. Obviously the greater you increase that, the more the ratio is going to be and then when you get to effectively 30 to 1 it's kind of, it's almost acting as a limiter. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty down and dirty way to describe what a compressor is doing but let's have a look what the compressor is doing. So let's open these. This is the before this is the compressor, and then this is the after. And there's a bunch of videos on this, but I just kind of wanted to touch on it since it is something that we use in all of our tracks all the time. So 
Let's get the threshold of all the way down and get the, we'll go four to one, make this back to zero, put this up to about 200, attack all the way down and we'll just keep the, the knee where it is. If I take this off, you can see we've got the same signal going, this is the before, going through the compressor and then out. If I start to bring down this threshold. Oh, probably need to turn it on. Let's turn on. We can see we've got signal going and let's start to pull down that threshold. You can see we got one dB of gain reduction. Let's bring it up to about minus five. So you can see we've got a visible change, but we don't want to just pull down the volume. We want to provide some makeup gain. So this is where we're looking. We got the peaks are kind of hitting around six. So if I increase this by six, that's where they're off and have a real listen to the sounds in the background. Obviously the drums are a little bit louder, so you need to sort of adjust the volume for that. But that sort of tambourine hat sound really gets lifted up in the mix because we're pushing all the peaks down. All these peaks are getting pulled down but then we're boosting the overall signal. So then that's bringing up that signal and some other bits and pieces. Again, there are many more videos that go well into depth with all of this when it comes to compressors because it can be a lot of information, but I just wanted to cover real quick to kind of see what's going on. Next up, we have a gate. Now gates are generally used to kind of cut out um, in the traditional sense, you would use it to kind of gate drums. So then if you have multiple microphones around a drum kit, you can gate out. So you have a snare drum, but then you're getting sort of a little bit of the tom coming through. You can gate out everything below a certain um, like level, and then you get more of a clean sound of just that snare or just that tom and so on. But we can use it in other ways to be a little bit more creative. And I've sort of covered this and you'll see there's a bunch of other videos covering this as well about how Bicep use it creatively. But in essence, we just have this super simple synth line. And then I've just put a gate on here and then I'm using a side chain. So the side chain is gonna be effectively triggering the gate to open and close. And I've used this little drum loop down here. So then you can see we've got it turned on. And when, it, when this loop gets above a certain threshold, it will trigger that on and off and then we can use in creative ways, we can start to use a release to kind of give us a build up. And back down again. So that's a way that we can, if you're using a lot of loops, but you don't have the ability to kind of add that real sort of big build up when you're using it as a, as a stab, you can add a gate in and then use that release as the open and close of like you would open and close in a filter to kind of give you more dynamics within your track instead of just chucking a loop in, calling it a day and then moving on to the next thing. Next up, we've got EQ and filters. I kind of put them both together because every filter is effectively just a EQ and every EQ is a kind of just a filter. So I know this is pretty basic, but again, if you're new to all the concepts and everything like that, I think this would be good to kind of go over. So we have our EQ. If we 
if we just look at the low frequencies and then go up. So this would be a high pass filter because we're letting all the high frequencies pass. If same, same, if we go from the high. And that would be a low pass and then you have everything in between so you could band pass if we start to bring it up you can use it as a notch and so on and so on so if you're not sure about which uh, filter to use and stuff like that you can just use an eq put it on there automate the the bits and pieces like we've you saw me just do now and you can be dialed in, you don't have to worry about which um, low pass or high pass free, uh, filter you should be using. So lastly, we're going to talk about distortion and bit reduction. So distortion is effectively overdriving the signal, but the big thing that it will do is give you more harmonics. So I have pulled up, we just have a sampler which is playing a sine wave. And you see it's just giving us around that single note, it just gives us that one frequency bump. If I turn on the distortion, you can see we start to get two there, and then as I, we have some more, let's move this up. So this is really good to know if you've got a synth sound or something like that that's not coming through on it's, it's not coming through on smaller speakers you can kind of duplicate the track cut the lows out and then add a or you can add the distortion and then cut the lows out and it will give you the more it will give you more like upper harmonics so you can hear it on smaller speakers but then you're going to cut the bass so you don't hear it on uh, you're not getting a double upper bass to hear on bigger systems and stuff like that and then very very last we have the bit reduction now we all know pretty much what bit reduction does is going to reduce the the sample rate of a of a sound so Again, let's bring up our two little trusty. This is before and after. And then we have the bit crusher here. You can see you can't really hear too much of a difference until you get sort of around sort of the 10 and then you start to increase this down sampling. You can see Instead of that smooth circle, a smooth sine wave, it's kind of cutting it up a little bit into these steps. The one thing that I really like to use the bit reduction for is mixing when I've got parts that are a little bit too loud. So obviously, again, this is before and after and then this is the clip level. So go along and we can start to decrease this clip level. And it's kind of chopping everything a little bit. You can see when we get to... Here, you can see this one's been chopped a little bit, but if I bypass and bring it back, you can't hear the difference. I mean, I can't hear the difference. Someone out there might be able to, but I find it's really good to kind of, instead of using another compressor or something like that, you just want to cut that peak off a couple of little bits and pieces. This is really good. Pull down that clip level and just tighten it all up. Obviously you can go crazy with it and just square the whole thing up, which you don't generally want to do. You want to leave some dynamics in your music. 
but if there's a couple of peaks that are just jumping out and you can't sort of dial it in the mix, just put this on there, tame everything and get you going. And that's about it for this week. Hopefully you've learned some things and if you have any other tips, I don't generally ask people to leave a comment, but if you have any other mixing tricks, please leave them below. If you even got to this part of the movie or the video, which most people didn't. At the end of the day, hopefully you got something out of this, but the main thing is hopefully this inspired you to create something. Until next time, see you later.